Military pilots identify a radar contact as an ally using IFF, which is short for Identification Friend or Foe. Civil pilots use a system of transponders to let air traffic controllers know where they are. This is called Secondary Surveillance Radar. But did you know these two seemingly different systems are the exact same thing? How did civil and military aviation end up using the same system for what on the surface looks like two very different applications? Keep watching and we'll answer that question. The need to identify aerial contacts goes back to the very earliest use of radar. During World War II, Britain set up the Chain Home Radar Network to provide advanced warning of German attacks. But on the morning of September 6, 1939, a deadly accident highlighted a significant flaw in the system. Fighters were scrambled to intercept a set of radar contacts that were believed to be incoming German aircraft. Without any way of identifying these aircraft, the interceptors had no way of knowing these contacts were actually friendly aircraft. And they unwittingly attacked them. They realized what happened after it was too late. In the end, they'd inadvertently shot down two friendly fighters and in the process killed one of their own pilots. This would become known as the Battle of Barking Creek and it resulted in the first death of a British pilot in World War II. Needless to say, this was a mistake that no one wanted to repeat. Both sides in the war came up with ways to mitigate the problem. The Germans devised a maneuver for this. When they received the predetermined signal from a ground operator, the pilot would roll the aircraft over. This changed the polarization of the radar reflection, which let the radar operators know that the pilot received their signal. The Brits had their own invention as well. One involved a radar reflective antenna that would make the return on a radar operator scope look distinct from aircraft without the reflector. Another involved aircraft carrying a special transmitter, which would be tracked by ground controllers. The signal would be geolocated with direction finding gear from two locations and then triangulated to a spot on a map. All of these solutions had significant problems. Forcing pilots to maneuver to identify themselves isn't always practical. The British radar reflector only worked for one frequency. So newer radars introduced later in the war that operated on different frequencies couldn't use it. The triangulation method was very manpower intensive and slow to operate. All of these problems were eventually solved through the use of a radar interrogation system. What this meant is a separate system carried on board an aircraft would respond to interrogation signals sent from a radar operator. The response was immediate and automatic, so it didn't take up the time of the ground controllers or the pilot. And since this new system worked on a frequency independent of the radar's emissions, it could be used with any radar system. This new system was called Identification Friend or Foe Mark I. As the war progressed, improved iterations were introduced which each had a new mark designation. But it wasn't until after the war that we would see a system that's close to what we have today with the introduction of IFF Mark X. That's not a numeral 10, but the letter X, which stood for experimental. And it's a lot like what's in use today. What Mark X did was allow an air crew to select how the transponder would reply to an interrogation signal. This is called the Selective Identification Feature, or SIF, and it took the form of a control box in the cockpit where a number could be dialed in. Here's how it worked. The interrogator would send out two pulses of radio energy on a frequency of 1030 MHz. The IFF transponder would listen on that frequency to determine how it needed to reply. If the interrogation pulses were 3 microseconds, which is 3 millionths of a second apart from each other, then it would respond in its first mode, which is aptly named Mode 1. With the delay of 5 seconds, it would know to use Mode 2 and 8 microseconds would indicate that a Mode 3 response was requested. This allowed an aircrew to have the option of setting three different numbers to use in response, one for each mode. And those numbers could be set from a control that looked like this. Though in some models the numbers would be fixed values that couldn't be changed. Numbers can be dialed in here for each mode, and depending on what mode was interrogated, that number would be sent back. But if you spun the dials, you might notice something unusual about them. They only go from 0 to 7. That's it. Now you might be wondering, where do the rest of the numbers go? We need to dig a little deeper to see why that's happening, and it has to do with radio pulses. When you're dealing with pulses, you have two options, on and off. Transmitting or not transmitting, so it's a binary system. 
you can use that as a numbering system, but it works a little different than the 1 to 10 decimal system we're used to. Each digit in binary represents a power of 2. So as you add digits, they double. It looks like this. The first digit has a value of 1, the second 2, and the third 4. So if all of them are blank, they are collectively valued at 0. But if this middle one is on, then the total is 2. Now if we also turn on this last digit, then they are collectively valued at 2 and 4, which is 6. Turn on all of them, and they're valued at 7. Now can you see why the numbers in the transponder go from 0 to 7? So in a mode 1 response, we could see three possible pulses here to represent the first digit, which could be anything from 0 to 7. Then a second pair of possible pulses here. Since there are only two in this set, it means the digit can only go from 0 to 3. So a mode 1 response could be anywhere from 00, 0 to 73. Typically, mode 1 is used to indicate the aircraft or mission type, like cargo plane or bomber. So there wasn't a need for a lot of codes. However, mode 2 and 3 did need more codes. So four sets of three pulses each are sent in these modes. And they would look like this. The response to an interrogation signal would need a beginning and an end. That would be a pulse here, and another one here, separated by 20.3 microseconds. It's important to have these bookends. Without them, the IFF receiver wouldn't be able to know where a pulse falls within this block. The position of pulses inside the block is important. These three represent the 1, the 2, and the 4 bit for the first number. These represent the second number, and these are the third and the fourth ones. To keep from interfering with the interrogation signal, the reply is sent on a different frequency, 1090 MHz. So an interrogator would transmit on 1030 MHz and listen for replies on 1090 MHz. You'll often hear Mode 3 IFF referred to as Mode 3A. This has to do with the revolution in air travel that happened in the late 1950s and early 1960s. With the influx of new civilian aircraft into the world's airspace, ATCs needed an efficient way to tell aircraft apart from each other. The military's IFF system proved to be an ideal way to do this. So the system was adopted and given its own naming system starting with Mode A. The system was used as is, right out of the box, which is why the military mode 3 and civil mode A are exactly the same. When in civilian use, the system of interrogators and transponders is known as ATC-RBS, which stands for Air Traffic Control Radar Beacon System. Modes B, C, and D were also defined, but of these four, only A and C are regularly used. An aircraft with both Mode A and C equipment installed will reply to interrogation signals with a four-digit Mode A response and a number indicating altitude in hundreds of feet for Mode C. So two separate replies. With both A and C active, a controller would see a display like this, with the transponder code and an altitude for each contact that replies. This gives ATC the ability to assign a code to each aircraft to help organize their airspace. Every aircraft can get its own code, but there are a few special codes that are reserved. 1200 is one that's used in the U.S. to indicate an aircraft is flying under visual flight rules and not directly in contact with ATC. So there might be multiple aircraft with this code in the air at once. There are also three common emergency codes. 7500 means the aircraft has been hijacked. 7600 is used when there is a communications failure and 7700 is a general emergency code. Mode 2 and 3A also have a special feature built in called a Special Position Indicator, or SPI. It's an extra pulse that gets added after the trailing pulse from the reply. The SPI is added when the aircrew presses a button on the IFF control. This will usually be in response to a request from ATC to squawk ident. When there's a lot of traffic on a controller's screen, this can help them quickly find an aircraft they are talking to. With an SPI active, the radar system can then highlight the reply on the screen, making it easier to find. Mode 3A works great, but the system isn't perfect. During the Vietnam War, the North Vietnamese found they could track U.S. aircraft by broadcasting interrogation signals and then triangulating any replies that came back. And it wasn't too difficult to do. A mode 1, 2, or 3 interrogation signal is just two pulses of energy sent out on a frequency of 1030 MHz. The only difference between them is the interval between the two pulses. 
anyone can send out these pulses and trigger a response from every transponder in the area. All responses are sent out on 1090 MHz in an unencrypted format. So it's not difficult for an adversary to find every mode 1, 2, or 3 transponder in their airspace. This tactic forced US pilots to turn off their IFF, which complicated the process of firing on targets beyond visual range. As a side note, the USAF also deployed a system known as the AN-APX-80, with the code name of Combat Tree, which did something similar. It triggered beacon systems built into the Soviet-supplied MiGs used by North Vietnam to give U.S. air crews a positive indication of an enemy aircraft. But U.S. aircraft still needed a solution to protect themselves from this kind of electronic attack. The solution came in a new mode, Mode 4. Also known as Mark 12, it added a 12-bit code to the interrogation signal that followed the main Mode 3 signal. This new code, which would just be a four-digit number, would be set prior to a mission in both the interrogator and the transponder. If the code in the transponder matched the one in the interrogation signal, then the transponder knew it had come from a friend. Then it would respond with the normal Mode 3 reply. This denied adversaries the ability to force a response. The 12-bit code was also put through a cryptographic algorithm inside the transponder. That algorithm would determine how long of a delay would be set before sending the response. So only someone with the secret code would be able to triangulate the location of the replying aircraft. The military wasn't the only user that found problems with Mode 3A. In civil aviation, overcrowding of the radio frequency became a challenge for ATC. Every response was sent over a single frequency, 1090 megahertz. With a lot of transponders in busy airspace, a single interrogation request would be answered several times. This presents a problem because not every airport has a traditional primary surveillance radar like what we've covered in these videos on radar. Instead, they have what's called a secondary surveillance radar to get aircraft positions. This is the system that sends out IFF interrogation signals and then uses the response to populate an ATC's computer screen. So with a lot of transponders in the air, there will be a lot of reply signals sent back. With the delay in the response being used to determine range, getting an unexpected reply from a different aircraft could paint a false image on an ATC screen. This is called a false reply unsynchronized in time. Or if it's a reply to someone else's interrogation signal, it's a false reply unsynchronized with interrogator transmissions. Either way, it spells out fruit and fruits present a challenge for controllers. So a solution was needed to selectively interrogate individual aircraft. That solution came in the form of Mode S, with the S standing for Select. Every aircraft with the Mode S transponder has a unique 24-bit number assigned to it. That means there are over 16 million possible codes that can be assigned worldwide. When a Mode S equipped aircraft enters a controller's airspace, then it will reply to the first interrogation signal it receives. But afterwards, it will be locked out of replying to broadcast interrogations. The only time it will respond is when its unique 24-bit number is used to selectively interrogate it. In addition to cutting down on interference, Mode S has some other features like initiating a data link. It can include additional information like a call sign, airspeed, or GPS location. We can see some of that extra information here on this radar screen. Mode S also enables other systems like TCAS, which allows aircraft to communicate directly with each other for collision avoidance. It can also participate in ADSB, which does things like help rescuers locate the plane if it crashes. And it's all backwards compatible with Mode A and C. The military also continued IFF development with the introduction of Mode 5, also known as Mark 12A. Like Mode 4, Mode 5 uses encoding to secure the interrogation and reply signals. But it's been upgraded from a simple 12-bit code to a cryptographically secure system certified by NSA. Mode 5 also introduced a random delay in the replies to prevent overlaps. This was a problem in tight formations like what you would see with fighters. They would all receive the interrogation signal at roughly the same time and respond right away garbling the response. 
so it was typical to see only the flight lead flying with an active IFF transponder. Mode 5 allows every aircraft in the flight to reply without risking an overlap. But that's not all Mode 5 adds. A lethal interrogation format was added, which informs the target of the interrogation that they are about to be fired upon if they don't reply. This provides a final attempt to get a valid reply to reduce fratricide. But that's not all. Mode 5 provides a two-way data link just like Mode S, except that it does all that with encryption to prevent eavesdropping. Unlike Mode 4, which used the same encryption key throughout the day, Mode 5 generates new encryption keys every few seconds. This makes it much more difficult for an adversary to crack. Mode 4 was officially decertified on June 30, 2020 by NATO, so all aircraft in NATO should be using Mode 5 today. But there are still nations that continue to use Mode 4 outside of NATO. IFF and SSR are both critical to aviation. We can thank this technology for making flying as safe as it is today. Without them, the skies would be a very dangerous place, both in and out of war zones. So I hope this video has helped to explain how this vital technology works. But if you still have any lingering questions, leave them in the comments, and as always, thanks for watching.